welcome back to part two of chapter 17, where we get to talk about the swallowing and the digestion and the going to the bathroom. And I have another crazy story for you today, except this one's a bit more personal. When then two years ago, my son decided to swallow a Mario coin. And I even have the pictures of the x-rays to show you. And now I'm never not going to talk about this to save his, his save from embarrassment. <laughs> the future, future students will show up. Oh, you're Wesley, huh? Yeah, my, my, t my teacher talked about uh, how you hated Mario coin and he's probably like somewhere in his head going, mom, although he's nine right now. He doesn't know what's coming. Ha 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 ha. Of course, like I said, he scared the ever living cheese out of me that day. All right, we'll get to that in a minute. All right, so we talked about the mouth. Let's get into salivary glands. So you've got several different types of glands, and um, and that's basically we've got the parotid glands, which are the largest of the glands. It has a duct. The parotid duct it enters the mouth behind the molars, and it secretes salivary amylase. Now, amylase is one of the enzymes. Remember, if it ends in ACE, it's an enzyme. If it am ends in OSE, it's a sugar. So amylase is one of the things that really, really goes into action, especially when you start chewing. Also, when it hits bread. When hit bread hits your mouth, it actually really, really stimulates you making amylase. Even thinking about bread or bready products makes us actually think about amylase, which kind of I'll get into in a minute. <laughs> There's an interesting story, which, you know, if, if that kind of triggers any kind of science memory and you sit there and you go, well, gee, if just thinking about bread makes you kind of make sal you know, saliva, is that kind of like, you know, with um, uh, Pavlov's dogs? And yeah, there's a, weirder, there's a weirder side to that. We'll get into that after I talk about the rest of these glands. So there's the submandular glands on the floor of the mouth, the ducts open under the tongue, secretes mucus, and the sublingual glands, these are the smallest of the glands, also on the floor of the mouth, but there's lots of these openings um, that open into the mouth. So it just depends on, on um, you know, and we do actually drool in thinking about food and whatnot, not always like, but um, if you actually sit there and try to think about food, you might notice that you're producing suddenly more uh, saliva. And that's normal. Um, we all do it. Pavlov you did figure it out that you could condition, that's where um, operant conditioning comes from, where you ring the bell and um, then feed the doggy. The doggy eats and then um, you ring the bell. And that way they get conditioned. Every time they hear the bell, they go, oh, it's time to eat. So they'll start drooling. And that's actually just an autonomic response. So he was actually playing around with that. And everybody thought that was amazing. And then one of his students, and I, I kid you not, guys, I, I wish I could make this up. Keep in mind, Pavlov was Russian. Um, I'm not entirely sure which part of Russia he was fine. I'd have to go look that up. But uh, one of his students decided to try and prove this, that this also happened in humans, which was kind of a duh. Especially after Pavlov's research, it was kind of a nobody really needed that cemented it was kind of implied and it was kind of like yeah we do it too but he wanted to actually show that so he went to a russian orphanage and actually uh enlisted the help of orphans and by enlisting the help of orphans i mean he paid off whoever was probably running the orphanages just to say can i test on these kids and they went yeah <laughs> yeah ethics what are those and uh where he strapped them in and used cookies yeah, he strapped, their, strapped them in a chair with their heads down, and there was a chute that would just go into their mouth with a cookie. And he'd ring a bell, and the cookie would come down the chute, and the kids would get a cookie. And finally he'd show, you know, finally he'd ring the bell, and no cookie, but the kids would still, you know, make the saliva, because they thought they were going to get a cookie. <laughs> So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Science. It's screwed up sometimes. So anyway, so the pharynx connects to the nasal and oral cavities with the larynx to the esophagus, and the esophagus leads down to the stomach. And I got, found this awesome uh, image of that right now, the dark part right there. 
There's the food that's going down, so there's the chewing. And again, and then the swallow, and it goes down. And you'll notice right here is where the airways are. See, it's open right here, but it restricts and closes off so the food goes that way, so that way we don't get food down our windpipe. Unless you're like me and you're yammering like a ding-dong while you're eating and then you start choking on your own spit because you're good like that. I do it so often. Anyway, so parts of the pharynx include your nasopharynx, which is above the soft palate so you can breathe, your oropharynx, which is for moving food and air down, and then your lar uh, laryngopharynx, which is the passageway to your esophagus. So major muscle groups, your superior constrictor muscles, your middle constrictor muscles, and your inferior constrictor muscles, you know, for constricting. If that wasn't, you know. So anyway, swallowing happens in three parts. And so first, voluntary, the food is chewed and mixed with saliva. The tongue rolls it into a mass called the bolus. So that's, instead of going, you know, the chewy up food in your mouth, we have a scientific name for that. That is the bolus. And then we force it into the oropharynx. And this is where the involuntary takes over. So the bolus reaches the oropharynx and stimulates the sensory receptors uh, to then the swallowing uh, reflex goes into action. And then you get the swallow reflex. So um, again, we, and while we're chewing, we can still breathe through our nose and down. So that way we don't have to choke unless you've got a cold. And I think we've all been there when we've had our sinuses completely stuffed up and breathing and eating is really <laughs> hard all of a sudden because you're like, I'm not, <gasps> I'm not because your nose is completely blocked up. Thanks, sinuses. So that's why usually we can breathe while we eat, um, unless we're sick and we've got everything blocked up in there. Um, anyway, then number three, peristalsis transports the food uh, in the esophagus down to the stomach through the gastropharyngeal sphincter muscles. So remember I said there's those sphincter muscles that are like cutoffs for each major area, so that way hopefully things won't go back through. Although the gastropharyngeal sphincter muscle can reopen if the stomach wants it to go backwards. But the rest of them, usually not. We don't want things going from the small intestines back into the stomach, and we don't want things from the large intestine going back into the small intestine, because that would be very, very bad. And I have a story for that as well, of one of my poor former co-workers who had major issues with the small intestine. So, and he's given me permission to yap about this. But anyway, so there you go. There's the three parts of swallowing, which is the first part voluntary and the next two parts involuntary. Do, 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 do. So, stomach. What does it do? It mixes the food with the gastric juice, the protein digestion, limited absorption. The stomach actually really absorbs water, kind of, if it can, but not much else. It really doesn't. It's not there for absorbing. It's there mostly for breaking it down. So food moves into your small intestine, and there's your uh, duodenum right there. So if you ever wonder what that family guy joke was with, uh, what's his face screaming, oh, my duodenum, and then falling over. There you go. Anyway, so there's four parts to your stomach. You got the body, the fundus, uh, the pylorus, and the cardia, which is this part right here where the uh, esophagus is coming in. And then you've got the cardinal notch and the lesser curvature and the greater curvature, which makes sense because it's the outside, it's the inside. So anyway, so there's layers of muscle around this guy and they're going in both directions. So they're going this way and they're going this way. And that is to make sure that he can get his groovy on. Remember I said he's got that side to side motion going on? So that's why he's actually got an inner circular layer and an outer longitudinal layer. And some parts actually have a third layer of oblique fibers. So again, so we've got the inner circular layer that goes you know, from this way and then the longitudinal layer that goes this way. So that way he can get that mixy groovy groovy on because you know he's got to mix up all that food we just chewed up, all that bolus and we just swallowed and goes in there and you know, gets with the digestion. Now, there's five parts of gastric juice. Um, there's the pepsinogen, which is the inactive form of pepsin. The pepsin, which is your, basically your main workhorse. And it's activated by your stomach acid. So your stomach acid is a hydrochloric acid, has a pH of 2. And mucus, which actually protects the stomach from eating itself. And then there's intrinsic factors that aids in B, uh, B12, vitamin B12 absorption. Remember, we need vitamin B12 to run a lot of our, um, to run a lot of our um, enzymes and whatnot. 
Now, we've gone from, when the food is all mixed up like this, we, it gets a new name. It's gone from the bolus to now it's called chyme. Chyme. Now, so the acid actually takes the pepsinogen and turns it on. So this is the guy that's literally the enzyme that's really digesting and breaking things down as well as hydrochloric acid. This is the thing that basically um, Dr. Beaumont figured out from my story from the last, uh, the first section of this, this uh, chapter here. And um, we do have mucus that protects the stomach lining. Uh, that way you don't have stomach uh, eat itself from its own hydrochloric acid. However, those mucus pumps can accidentally turn off and then you get start getting stomach ulcers, which is not a good thing. It's literally when your stomach is eating itself, uh, <laughs> eating itself up, and we don't want that. We don't want that. So, um, and that mucus is very important to protect the stomach from itself. Um, fun fact: your stomach acid is actually so strong that you can actually swallow snake venom and be fine as long as you do not have a. Uh, uh, ulcer down there. Uh, and basically what's going on is, and I've done this before, I've actually drank uh, snake venom when I was at the zoo. I actually learned how to milk venomous snakes and I actually drank um, uh, snake venom once. It just tasted like warm spit. It didn't really have a taste, which is fascinating to me. Um, so uh, yeah, the reason I did it just to see, but also um, it doesn't work unless it hits blood. If it doesn't hit blood, it doesn't do anything. So yeah, you can drink venom, uh, but if it hits your blood, you're in trouble, which is why, you know, if you have a stomach ulcer, don't drink snake venom, because that's gonna hit blood and then it's gonna make a whole world of hurt for you. Uh, poison, on the other hand, don't drink that. That, that. that doesn't work, it doesn't work like that. So venom, you can drink. Poison, you cannot. So there you go. Uh, so yeah, venom only works when it hits blood, so it's kind of interesting. Um, like I said, it's just one of those things, it's like, you want to drink it? It's just like, oh, right, sure. Drag a little bit, it's just, like I said, it tastes like warm spit, I guess. It just didn't taste like anything. So, if you ever wanted to know what that ta tastes like, or how that was, it was fine. Nothing happened. It was just kind of neat, uh, milking the, uh, uh, rattlesnake. Anyway, so gastric juice is made all the time and is under control of neural and hormonal regulation. So our neural regulation is our sympathetic decreases activity and parasympathetic which increases activity and they do this through histamine. Um, so remember sympathetic, remember that's fight or flight so that you're sitting there going, oh god the zombies are coming. The last thing you want to think about when the zombies are coming to eat you is if you're hungry or not. So it actually does shut down the uh, digestive system for a bit because at the moment, nobody cares if you're digesting cake because you're trying to live. Um, but when the parasympathetic, which is rest or digest, comes back in, basically that increases activity to make up for anything you've lost when you were under the sympathetic, or, you know, fight or flight. So yeah, that's neural regulation. And then you got hormonal regulation. So this is where our friend somatostasin comes in, gastrin, gastrin's a big boy. Um, gastrin basically is the one that kind of lets you know that you're hungry. And we'll talk more about this in a minute. Um, gastrin's one of the things that goes, hey, I am hungry. And then your brain goes, hey, you are hungry. And then I go, oh, good. And then I go get eat Oreos because I make wonderful choices or whatever, you know, I try to be a good girl. I try to eat good food, but then, you know, cookie. So anyway, so yeah, I uh, run over and eat the cookie. And then when my stomach is full, it actually uh, inhibits gastrin and lets us know, and I believe I have a, a better uh, image of this later of how all that works. So, um, and then, you know, I don't feel hungry anymore. So gastrin's one of our buddies that does the, the hormonal dance of, are you hungry? And when the stomach is full, uh, no, I'm not hungry anymore, I am full. So we'll get into that a little bit more. I believe I have a, another uh, a page that actually has a better enhanced version. Enhance. So here's again, the mixing and emptying actions, as you can see. It, it, struggles back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. 
and then drains so everything's the bolus is entering this sphincter and you notice how the sphincter closes up um, on normal days now uh, what passes through and how quickly so liquids actually pass through the most quickly which is actually why we get into a lot of trouble with calories uh, in liquids because our body's kind of stupid it's kind of like a trojan horse on how to get calories sneaky calories in that you don't need which unfortunately is like any delicious frappuccino from starbucks as much as we all love them we love our coffee products yes we do um unfortunately that because liquids pass through very quickly uh that's actually how we can sneakily get in a lot of calories in a drink which can uh, lead to a lot of fat gain down the road that a lot of people don't realize is an issue it's like if you're but i'm eating correctly and everything yeah but if you're still having a starbucks frappuccino or anything like it um uh, every dang day then yeah, you're sneaking in all your calories liquid wise so you got to watch out for them liquids um which is why i don't drink soda anymore um uh, my husband lives on it but i can't uh solids remain until mixed with gastric juice uh fatty acids they usually last about three to six hours in the stomach which is probably why you know we love our fatty foods they fill up but they're also not terribly good for us so fatty foods will stick around longer, or at least it feels like it does, but it's also, again, sneaking in a ton of calories we don't need, and therefore it gets transformed into fat, and then it goes, you know, moment on the lips, forever on the hips, that kind of stuff. Foods high in proteins move quickly. Uh, carbs are faster than fats or proteins. So if you go through, you know, who, from fastest to slowest, it's liquids, carbs, then proteins, and then fatty foods. So there you go. That's what goes from fastest to slowest, moving through your stomach, getting digested. It takes, it takes a bit to break down uh, fats. Fats are actually really hard to break down, which is also why we have problems building up so much fat in our bodies after time, because breaking it back down, it's rough. It's not easy. So anyway, pancreas. Remember we talked about him? He's bad. So the pancreas is a multitasker as he's an endocrine gland regulating our blood glucose. Remember those insulates of Langerhand when we've got the alpha cells and the beta cells and it has insulin and glucagon and all that fun stuff. Well, it's also an exocrine gland and that helps digesting. So pancreatic juice contains enzymes that digest carbohydrates, fats, proteins, and nucleic acids. Remember those four things that build up into the four biomolecules that we're made of? Bingo, bango. This guy helps break these down into the components, those monomers I talked about earlier, so that way we can recycle it and turn it into you. So the pancreatic amylase, so this is again similar to our amylase up here, but survives better down in there. Our amylase, uh, you know, mouth amylase likes it around 7, pH of 7. Pancreatic amylase, not so much, but it splits starch into glycogen and into dis disaccharides. Uh, pancreatic lipase again if it ends in ace it's an enzyme so amylase so it's breaking down amylose which is what you find in bread products and whatnot lipase so lipids so it's breaking down fats breaks down triglycerides so bye bye butter uh trypsin oopsie go back we're not talking about the liver yet so trypsin digests proteins releases uh inactive uh trypsin which is activated in the small intestine. Uh, this digest proteins released as inactive and then activated by, uh, activated by these guys. Uh, carbo, carbopepsidase, again, digest proteins released as inactive, but then gets turned in by trypsin here. Nucleases, which digest nucleic acids and bicarbonate ions make pancreatic juice alkaline, basically to buffer the stomach acid. Remember, stomach acid has a pH of 2. We don't want that out of the stomach. Remember, a stomach makes mucus protect itself from itself. And that pH of 2, we don't want in the small intestine. The small intestine works at a different pH. And we also don't want to digest our small intestine. So that's where the pancreas comes in, and he makes it, uh, the pancreatic juice very, very, very base. Which, remember, if you add a base to an acid, it will go through neutralization and turn it into basically hot salt water. Um, so that's basically what's going on here. We've got to buffer the stomach acid and reduce or actually increase the pH from a two up to, you know, 
six ish i think and um so that way your uh, a your stomach juices don't digest your small intestine and actually that's what some joints uh, parts of the small intestine are for that we're going to get into after we talk about the liver the liver is actually kind of cool uh the liver is the largest internal organ and the only one that can regenerate like you can cut off like a third of this sucker and it will regenerate anything past a third though uh no so it can regenerate some it can't regenerate all the way um so basically he's got a lot of little things hidden inside of him remember the liver does a lot of different things for us um he's uh you know well actually let's get into it so what does he do he removes potentially toxic byproducts of certain medications so he's a filter um he prevents shortages of nutrients by storing vitamins minerals and sugar so that's basically when we go into fight or flight, uh, the liver actually gets signaled to start releasing its uh, stored glu uh, glycogen and, to, and then turn it into glucose. So we've got the ATP to run away from the threat, whether it be zombies or dinosaurs or whatever. And then, uh, it metabolizes or breaks down nutrients uh, uh, from food to produce energy when needed, as I just said. Produces most of the proteins needed in the body. Produces bile, which is basically something we need to digest fat and absorb vitamins A, D, E, and K. Because fat is such a, like I said, it's hard to break down. So we need our own way to do that, and we do that with bile. Um, so it produces most of the substances that regulate blood clotting and helps uh, your body fight infection by removing bacteria from the blood. So he's a filter. He's storage. He's, he's everything, man. He'll, he bakes. He cooks. He vacuums. He does the dishes. It's all the things. So anyway, let's talk about bile. So basically, what is bile? Bile is mostly water with bile salts, and these are actually produced from cholesterol. So we actually do need cholesterol to make bile. They emulsify fats. In other words, they break down fats. It is a yellow-greenish liquid and that hepatic cells continuously secrete. And um, bile components have a, a digestion. Again, they break down fats. Fats without something to emulsify it? Yeah, it's really rough to do. Um, it's kind of like why we use soap that emulsifies fats. But we don't want to make our own soap. That would be a little weird. So instead we created bile. So bile pigments um billy rubin and billy verdon are derived from the hemoglobin breakdown so that's basically the two pigments which gives it that green, yellowish green color which you've noticed if you've ever you know had to uh vomit and um it's also made of cholesterol and electrolytes so that's the components of bile water bile salts bile pigments cholesterol and electrolytes so like i said liver's crazy important bile very important because uh you know we need that to digest our fats because our stomach cannot do that alone we need to add something to it to break it down even further so we can get those sweet sweet fatty acids so we can make our own fat yay now speaking of bile um we actually have a thing that stores the bile and empties into the duodenum and that is our friend who lives kind of you know up and on the underside of the liver and that is our friend the gallbladder uh so uh stores and concentrates bile and empties into the duodenum and however this is a double-edged sword because too much bile and too much cholesterol sometimes it makes crystals and these crystals grow into gallstones which are not cool so remember too much bile too much cholesterol you get gallstones actually one of my former co-workers had to have his gallbladder removed um he even talked to the doctor it was so funny he was the assistant principal for my school for a while I, I really enjoyed his sense of humor great guy um he even offered to, to, to like he's like i should have asked him to put it in a jar for you could have been your uh, hall pass for your <laughs> instead i got a plastic you know foot from a, a horror uh, thing around halloween you know so they, they had to bring out it looked like a, like somebody had chopped a foot off somebody so they had to bring around a fake foot to the bathroom in high school because you knew which room you were out of if you had a fake horror foot with you oh i see you've left miss royal's room you have the foot <laughs> anyway 
But yeah, it, it was kind of a running gag. He was going to give me his gallbladder in a jar, and I'm just like, oh, yeah, that's cool. Because I always promised myself, if I had a major in the light, like I had to get something out of me, I would want it in a jar so I could show it to people. Because why not? I made it. Alright, small intestine, which is not that small. Um, like I said, the whole surface area of the sucker is about the size of a tennis court, so it's like, you can next time go to Jackson Park, stand on a tennis court, or whatever park has near you, as uh, it's not everybody in this class is in Hendersonville right now. Whatever park is near you, go to a tennis court, stand there, and just go, oh my god, all of this is in my, in my small intestine? Yes. So... Um, this is where the, all the absorption happens. It gets the chyme from the liver, um, from the stomach, excuse me, the liver and the pancreatic secretions, puts it together and turns it into uh, basically everything we try to suck out of it, which is, we try to suck everything out of it. So there's three parts to it. The duodenum, which is the shortest part. It's literally just this bit right here. And that is literally where everything's dumping in, again, to try and buffer the stomach acid so we don't have stomach acid coming down and hurting us. So this is where the pH change happens right here. So it goes from like a pH of 2 into a pH of, I believe, 6. Double check that on your book. Um, so anyway, the duodenum, which is basically the most active part, that's the part that's literally uh, absorbing as much as possible out of everything we've just just digested and turned into you know absolute liquid fied foodiness and we're going to absorb as much as we can get out of it and then the ileum which is the end part and this contains lymph nodes and the ileum uh, basically again this is if something have managed to survive getting through uh the stomach acid without being destroyed and there are some things that can um, this is basically, uh, again, uh, where our lymphatic system kind of jumps in and has lymph nodules, so another checkpoint for it to go, looks good, looks good, looks good, looks good, so. You might be like, why isn't it at the top near the duodenum? I don't know, I wasn't there when they, when they, they, they came up with this, so anyway. Nobody, nobody talked to me. Yeah, you'd think it'd be better, like, right here or something, but eh, it worked out. Anyway, um, getting to the story of my, uh, my other poor co-worker, uh, what happened was uh, one day, uh, his part of his small intestine pinched and started dying. Um, it was insane because what happened was he looked terrible. I mean, he looked like he had a fever that morning. And teachers, and this is true for the majority of teachers, we don't like being out because we're sick, even though this is really bad about us. Um, because substitutes, and trust me, I could have an entire thing on, on the horrors of some we've had with some substitutes. I've got some stories, but I can't tell them right now. Um, but long story short. Um, yeah, so we have a bad habit of showing up, you know, even if we're feeling bad, just to, you know, uh, basically make sure that our, our room isn't torn apart or, you know, some sub gets in that's just not doing a very good job of making sure the room doesn't get torn apart. Um, I'm sure you probably have sub stories too. But anyway, as students. Um, so anyway, but he looked terrible. And the kids even sat there and looked at him and said, you look terrible. And he's just like, I'll be fine, I'll be fine. And finally the kids ran out and uh, they ran into my room and then a lot of them ran downstairs and got the principal, thank God. They ran in my room and they said, Mr. Swanson looks like white as a sheet. And I'm like, oh, dang, that's not good. And I'm like, have you guys went down and told the office? And they're like, yeah, some of us already ran and did. Thank God. So the guy, uh, our principal goes up, takes one look at him and says, you're going to the ER. Or I think it was, he's like, okay. And, and like, uh, my, he was like, no, no, I don't need to. I just need to sleep. And he goes, no, 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 no. You look horrendous. We're getting you to the ER. And he's like, no, I want to go to, like, you know, um, urgent care. And he was like, no, ER. So we brought him to the ER. Good thing. Uh, because what had happened was uh, his intestines had twisted. Uh, the duodenum part had twisted. And about a foot of it was dead. Uh, they had to go in and cut out over a foot and then rejoin it back together. 
yeah, he would have died if it wasn't for uh, my principal insisting on dragging him to the ER. So, yeah, absolutely crazy. Uh, that's the story of, yeah, you need this. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of important. So again, as I was saying, if you zoom in on this sucker, not only will you see that the small intestine is very, 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 very ridged, but even the ridges have ridges. So if you look at this guy, so again, the ridges have ridges. And then if you look at a cellular level, these ridges have microvilli. So the, the surface area is intense, so that way we can absorb as much as we can out of what we've just digested. So yeah surface uh, so I like ridges on ridges with ridges with ridges with even more microscopic ridges to absorb as much as possible and then to keep it all in place we've got this lovely mesentery area that kind of webs like i said if uh we were in uh you know face to face i would actually uh you know hand you a uh you know a, a um a fetal pig and you'd go ahead and check that out and everything is pretty crazy so because a lot of people pull, pull that when they're pulling the small intestine, pull this out, and they're like, oh, wow, interesting. So anyway, and here's the colon right here. And here's your appendix, by the way. Your appendix actually does have a job. Um, he, uh, as I've mentioned back in the uh, lymphatic system, he actually carries good bacteria, which is why, unfortunately, sometimes he can be infected with bad bacteria. So, but, uh, and then you have to take care of him, and then you gotta get rid of him. But he does have a job, he does exist. And it's not some leftover from ancient times. It's literally, he has a job. It's just sometimes he's not that great at it. Anyway, large intestine. So, has little or no digestive function. Actually, basically what his job is, is literally to suck water out so we don't lose water through this whole process. So it contains tubular glands containing goblet cells. They secrete mucus, the only significant secretion of the large intestine. Basically, we make it so when we're sucking everything out of it we're making sure it doesn't like stiffen up so bad that you get an obstruction up there because can you imagine Blah. anyway so absorbs water about 90 percent of the water that enters it we reabsorb in electrolytes again we need these so we're reabsorbing that all back through the process houses our intestinal flora so we do have good bacteria that lives in our intestines which break down things like cellulose and any other thing that we can't break down um, so they get a cut of the action. So they help us break things down. And we uh, say, thank you very much. Here's some food. And, um, you know, you may continue to live in our colon. And they're like, yeah, cool, thanks. So they break things down that we can't break down. And they get a cut of the food. I think it works out for everybody. Which is why if you go on antibiotics, it can kill them, which is not great. And that's why you have to take like biotic food afterwards to like get that good healthy st uh, uh, bacteria back down in there hanging out and being your friend. So we actually do have a symbiosis with gut bacteria. So thank you gut bacteria. We love you. Um, and we're sorry if we have to take antibiotics and kill you off because that's not cool. But you know that usually means another bacteria is up in being rude and yeah. So anyway. Um, so produces uh, vitamins K, B12, thymine, forms feces, and carries out defecation. And also, again, you can see this is where that little tail hangs off right here, and that's your appendix. Hi! So we, we basically call it the, interestingly enough, the cesium, the ascending colon because it's going up, the transverse colon because it's going across, the descending colon because it's going down, and then the sigmoid colon which goes over and then goes into the rectum and the anus and out it goes into the toilet and then you flush so uh changes to the digestive system are slow and slight eventually include the following um tooth enamel thins teeth may become sensitive mine definitely came through that uh gums may recede teeth may loosen break or fall out the gi tract becomes less efficient uh, gastric secretion slows, constipation may become more frequent, nutrient absorption decreases, including fat-soluble vitamins, um, incidence of lactose intolerance increases, accessory organs age, but typically not in the ways that affect health, um, except for like, you know, diabetes that, that increases with the pancreas suddenly not becoming very good at its endocrine job. Remember, pancreas is running two jobs in your body, endocrine and exocrine. 
which is pretty, pretty intense. He's an intense guy. All right, so this brings me to the story of my son swallowing a coin. So about two years ago, um, it was the first day of summer break. And I was like, ah, oh, summer break. And I, um, you know, Wesley and I were home. My husband, who's the head custodian um, at Apple Valley, he doesn't really get a break like we do. He has to work all year because he's a custodian. So I woke up and I was just like, I was going to have a leisurely cup of coffee. <laughs> and I was going to sit down. And I was going to read a book and just be chill for the first free and clear day of summer. Right? No. I walked out to go get my cup of coffee and Wesley walks up to me and goes, uh, mommy? And I go, yeah. And he goes, I did something. I'm like, okay. See, I try not, as a parent, I try not to get mad until I've heard what the heck it is and even then it's usually something you can fix. So it's like, you know, don't get crazy off the bat. But he was like, I swallowed a coin. And I'm like, well, he's not choking to death. So that's the first thing that crossed my mind is like, if he's standing upright, he's not blue in the face. He's talking just fine. So apparently it went down just fine. <laughs> and I'm like, what coin? I go, like a penny or a dime or, and he goes, no, the Mario coin. And at this time he was putting everything in his mouth and chewing on it constantly. It was just, he was very much sticking everything in his mouth. We had to sit there and Wesley, get that out of your mouth. Wesley, get that out of your mouth constantly back then. Um, and, um, yeah, it was a Mario coin. So they made those Matchbox Mario, like, racers that were based on, like, you know, what you play in Mario Kart and whatnot. And one, a, a lot of them had this little slot in the back to hold this little coin. And it was looks like a coin from the Mario games. But it was plastic on the outside and metal on the inside. And I'm sitting there going... Oh my God. So I, I sat there, I called his pediatrician. They said, bring him to the ER. I'm like, oh great. So anyway, I mean, he was breathing fine. So that started my first day of summer, sitting with my son for the entire day in the ER. I mean, we sat there for, from like, I think nine o'clock until five o'clock until we were finally seen. And that's when we got these x-rays done. And you can clearly um, see uh, the uh, coin sitting in the bottom of my son's stomach. And they just said, well, let's just watch it. Um, should pass in like four weeks, so just keep checking his poop. They gave us some stuff to catch poop and check his poop. And yep, about four weeks later, this came out. This is what's left. So the stomach acid is intense. I mean, just look, that is, remember, like I said, it had a plastic coating. And, and slug metal on the inside of that plastic coating and that's all that was left. And some other fragments of that coin that he ate after four weeks. So there you go. He's fine. I don't know if he got any superpowers because of it other than a nice $500 bill for mommy. So it just goes to show, don't swallow coins, thank you. All right, with that said, um, I'm going to end here with chapter 17. Uh, feel free to definitely watch um, Crash Courses on all of this. It's super useful because Crash Courses are good. With that said, uh, yeah, I'll see you in the next chapter where we talk about some chemistry with digestion and whatnot. So I'll see you in chapter 18 in just a minute. Bye.